looks down on my situation and knows exactly what I need, even when I think I can fix it. He knows best and says there's certain things that he won't allow us to do because he knows the outcome of things far before we do. And so I'm just grateful that uh, uh, the, the opportunities of work, people don't understand, and, and doing the business that I do, it's more than just uh, grabbing a paintbrush. I remember you know, becoming a pastor, a senior pastor, and I remember the, the board telling me, well, if you're gonna be our pastor, you can't work. And I said, where did you get that from? And they said, well, you know, we want a pastor that's like this. We want a pastor that we can reach 24 hours a day and all of that. And I said, well, don't ever think that I'm not able to do the work of the Lord because I love working with my hands. And if you want to hear God, you won't pull that paintbrush out of my hand. If you really want to hear what he has to share, don't take me away from the thing that literally makes me a part of what he wants here on earth. My father told me as a little boy, even when we were going through the foster system and you know, a, a man who was so proud and a man who got stripped of identity because they, they because he was of Cuban descent, you know, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, they took his position, took his job, and now he's in the country that says, now you can't afford your children, so let's take your children. So now I have to deal with a father who's angry and a mother who almost, well, actually did. She actually lost her mind for a minute because how would the mother respond if you take their children from her? And so now here we are with seven of us and we're scattered and living with strangers and not knowing what love is because I thought I knew until you stripped it from me. Because how can someone who doesn't know me love me more than the one who's given birth to me? And so I sat back and my father told me when we got back together, and I remember him doing what he had to do to bring his family together. For, for him, it didn't matter if we lived in an abandoned building because as long as we were together, love had a way of bringing us all back to life. So even the system had to change because he was a man who said, I don't care if you put me in jail. Those are my children and I'm going to be with my children. And when I, re I remember coming back together, my father always said, they, they could have stripped me of what they thought was theirs, but God gave me two good hands. And my father wasn't a, 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 a God-fearing man in the sense of going to church, but he knew that there was something far greater than himself to even bring his family back together. And I'll never forget being a little kid, and he would say, uh, clean that up. And I would just clean it up, not knowing why. He will put a paintbrush in my hand and said, stop the paint. And I remember just doing things because he told me, as long as you work with your hands, you'll never go hungry. There's something about what God gives us the ability to do that if we do it correctly, we won't go hungry. And this is why there are times, even when I'm out there and I see those who are working for that quarter, for that dollar, I usually never turn away from giving because they're in a position to earn it. And so here's the thing with our lives. We have to be very, very mindful of what it is that we're supposed to do. Because we can easily pass judgment on something that we don't know what's going on in their lives. We have no idea. And so I've learned, I've learned that everyone is an individual. Everyone has their own journey to take. But the God that we so serve knows this journey. And he knows it so well. And what type of God would he be to give someone the best and someone less than him. Because then that will make him a respectable person. But just like anything else, life has a way of giving us instructions so that we can live a good life. Don't get angry at the billionaire who, who did all he or she needed to do to earn what they had. Don't get angry at that. Because there is something that we can all do to better our lives. There's something we can all do to get connected to a God that we say we want to know. Because until he's personal, he'll always be questionable. Mm -hmm. Until he becomes your, don't tell me about your God. Until he becomes someone to me, I have a right to question it. And so now we're living in a state where you are trying so hard to convince the people that don't want to be convinced. 
And it's difficult to convince when you're not fully convinced. And so God took me to a scripture today, and uh, well, not, not today, just, just on this week I was walking with it. And because, you know, as, as pastors, you know, uh, just speaking to someone this morning, you know, it's quick to say, well, I was going to call, but I know you're busy, pastor. I was, and here's the thing. Even in busyness, we're supposed to always reach out. So it doesn't matter if I'm pastoring or if I'm working in someone's home. At the end of the day, if we're a family, it's amazing how quick family call each other. Don't even think about how busy they are. So if we're supposed to be a family, we should, should have the opportunity to reach out. Because all I can say is, I'll call you right back. All I can say is, we'll talk later. But what we don't want to do is isolate ourselves and get into a place or in a space when we need someone and we find ourselves by ourselves. And remember how I utilize that word isolate. When you isolate yourself and be by yourself, when it's time to come out, usually you're late. Mm. I so late. Mm. <laughs> so God says, don't sit there and go through all this stuff all by yourself. There are people you can reach out to. There are people who love you. There are people who, who want to extend themselves. But the reason why we hold back so much is because people disappoint us so much that we sit as if the next person is going to do the same. And that's not fair in a relationship. Mm. Don't put on me what someone else did to you. Until you right. can try this relationship, don't accuse me of something I didn't do. Right. And I believe that God is dealing with the people because we, I think we accuse God of doing some things he's never done. So let's go to the book of Jeremiah. And for those who are new, I, I, I love to say this. I'm someone who loves to give you enough to remember and not too much to forget. So we'll give you enough, but not too much, because I think enough, enough is, is will get you through. So in Jeremiah chapter number one, and just to give you a brief history, the book of Jeremiah has the second amount of largest, the second largest amount of chapters outside of the book of Psalms. So there's a lot of information in the book of Jeremiah. There's a lot of great information in the book of Jeremiah. We, we know that the Bible, as, as the old folks used to say, biblical instruction before leaving earth. The Bible. Biblical instructions before leaving earth. This has a way of literally taking you through this journey called life to set you up for life. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. There's so much more than what we think we know. There's so much more. So let's walk through the book of Jeremiah. Do we all have it? Jeremiah 1 and 1. We'll start there. It says, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Amon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, on to the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, on to the carrying away of Jerusalem, captive in the fifth month. Why are those things so important? I mean, even when you go into the book of Genesis, there's always something about names. and Because, see, God wants us to understand that we all come from some place. And a lot of us can remember some tough times with family, tough times and tough things. But God wants us to know that there's a lineage that's in our family that may, you may have never met. But I know, I know that every one of us in here have family members who sought the face of God in one way, shape, or form and prayed for a generation, prayed for us even before we ever existed. I believe that. And this is why, this is why, if we look at verse number four, now this is going to be Jeremiah's assignment we went through his lineage. We went through who he's connected to. Now here comes the assignment, Jeremiah, because we're all not here just to be a passerby. We all have a job to do here on earth. And here is Jeremiah's assignment. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, Behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. 
But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. So just for a few minutes, I just want this to resonate in your spirit. The word never mind, or don't bother. Never mind, <coughs> don't bother. Right here in the book of Jeremiah, here Jeremiah is given an assignment from God, and the first thing Jeremiah wants God to understand is that I'm not equipped to do what you want me to do. I am, I'm just not the one you really want to use right now, God. I, I'm not, I'm not, can I just go and be about my business? But he, 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 he lets Jeremiah understand, Jeremiah, please understand that before you were ever formed, I knew you. Before you ever entered your mother's belly, I already sanctified you. I already set you apart. I already destined you for greatness. And most times, it's amazing because we'll read this time after time in the Bible because 800 years prior to this revelation to Jeremiah, here is the Lord speaking to another great man who we hear of often by the name of Moses and tells Moses, here's your assignment. And Moses says the same thing. I can't speak. How powerful is it that our words can either bring us life or either can bring us death? He said, life and death is in the power of the tongue. So when you have the power to speak life, life can happen as parents. I know when you encourage your children, you give them words of affirmation, you give them words so that they can run with, and you say, this is what you can do, these are the things, why? Because as long as they can hear it, there's something inside of them that will pursue the very thing they believe came from a safe place. See, love has a way of giving us instructions and we obey it. If you don't love me, and you give me instructions, most times I may go the opposite way. <laughs> Because I already don't trust where the information is coming from. And so now God is trying to get Jeremiah, just like he did Moses, stop saying what you won't do. If I'm telling you who you are, can you just trust and believe that I have the ability to put the things inside of you that can far exceed what you ever thought you could do for yourself? And this is why, as, as a body believer, it hurts me at times that when things go on in our lives, we crumble. And we crumble in a way that the world has to be the one to help us out of it, when in actuality, it gives them the very reason why they don't want to serve a God. Because if he's that good, and he's that wonderful, and, and this life is so good, how, do, how come I don't see the benefits of this thing? The Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. So if I'm running around and I'm saying, I am an orange tree, I'm an orange tree, take some of my orange, I make great orange juice, then all of a sudden a wind comes or something happens in my life that now you can't see this orange tree. Because now I'm downtrodden, now I don't want you to eat from the tree, now I don't want you to, to uh, 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 do things um, that causes me to have to assist because today I don't want to be an orange tree. Today, I don't want to be the one to encourage. Today, I don't want. And this is the unfortunate part because God's trying to get us to understand that you may not have the ability, but I do. I have the ability. This is why, Jeremiah, I'm going to put the words in your mouth so that you can speak because never mind telling me never mind. Never mind that. Never mind letting me understand that me as God, as Father, as the one when things are wonderful, you can't stop lifting your hands. When things are magnificent, you can't stop praising me. You, but let a little something happen in your life. And I'm the last person you want to talk to. But I'm the person that's in your mind and making you, making you kind of sway in a sense because I know what you're already thinking about me because you're saying, why would I let this happen to you? If you love me so much, God, why am I going through this? But then the same word that we read lets us know in this life, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have all these things. But he tells us to take, take good courage. Be courageous. Here is the key. 
the battle is already won. <coughs> oh, it sure doesn't feel that way. <coughs> this pain really hurts. And so, so if it's already won, why do I feel what I feel? Because I'm trying to let you understand that you're a lot more powerful than you give yourself credit for. It's amazing that I can put you in the ring with someone who's half your size and you are so confident in taking them out because you feel already that you're strong and you're bolder. What happens when I put you in the ring and the person's three times your size? What happens when you have to look at it and look at that challenge and now totally, David, depend on me because Goliath took everybody out? What happens then? Or do you tell me at that moment, Lord, never mind, this is not something I want to get into right now. <laughs> this is not something I, because just in case I don't win, I don't want others to talk about me. How often, as people of God, we go in our own strength, and this is why we don't want to pray for people, this is why we don't want to encourage, because just in case it doesn't happen, I don't want you calling me back and saying, man of God, woman of God, this doesn't work. Oh. But see, if I'm going on my strength, I'm going to let you know now, it won't work. And my dependency isn't on my strength. My dependency on the one who has given me something and continues to give me something so I can see myself far greater than I see myself now. Why? Because we have to be reminded that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know fearfully and wonderfully changes in attitude? If you look at someone's confidence, if you look at someone who holds their head up high, there's something about what that individual has that makes the world respond to who they are. So the first thing we need to do is keep our head up. Why? It's not just for you, it's that you can keep your eyes on the ground. And so God is trying to get us to understand that it's so important because here is the thing. The word no, and, and for those of us who are part of this fellowship, I, I, I say this often, the word no is a very honest answer. It's the yes we get disappointed with. It's the people who tell us yes. Pastor, whatever you need, yes, yes. So because of your yes, there are some things I didn't do because I'm dependent on your word to be true. But if you were to tell me no, that would have been very honest to me, and I could have moved on and create something so that this assignment could get accomplished. So when you come to me, Jeremiah, and you say no, Please understand, this is letting you, K-N-O-W, that you're not quite connected the way you say you are. Because to say no to God is to let you know that there's a disconnect somewhere because you fully don't trust him. Because the N-O lets you K-N-O-W a whole lot quicker than the yes. How often do we tell God yes? God, if you get me out of this situation, yes, I'll do it. God, if you do yes, 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 only in our heart of hearts to really say no. And God is saying, here's the thing. I already know your thoughts because I, crea I created you. And before your mommy met your daddy, I've ordained you. I set you aside. So here's the thing. You can keep running if you want. The destination is still the destination. When you tell someone they're destined for greatness, the thing about God is that God never changes. We do. Right. As a people, we are the most up and down, love me today, hate me tomorrow. I was great for you today, tomorrow, I don't know what I did, but something said I never want to be around him again, never to console me, never to tell me what's going on. But because we're so emotional, we treat God the same way. And you guys remember that sermon, your thoughts of God are too human. He says, they that worship me once worship me spirit and the truth. There is something that's so far greater on the inside of us that connects with the true and living God. And that's the work. The work is to get beside our emotions and find out for ourselves how real this thing really is. How much does it really transform us? How much does it really shift us? Because if not, life is going to continue to put us on this roller coaster ride. We're going to scream when we hit the top. And when we're coming down, we're going to hold our hearts to make sure we don't pass out. Right. God is saying, hold on. I need you to hold on. So be honest. Be honest with God. And if you don't know, tell him I don't know. Because I got news for you. Even as a pastor and even as I sit here with the sacred word of God, there is going to be a part of me that may disappoint you. But one thing I do know is that the word of God is true. 
and that the God that you serve wants this to specifically speak to your situation. Because even in my situation, if we go through the same thing, because I'm a different person, the response can be different. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be A through Z according to what Pastor Alex says. No. Because I'm not the ultimate answer. This is the ultimate answer. And this is why when people say, Pastor Alex, we need, I want to go over what you said. I want to spend time with that word. I want to spend, because for me to think that I know this in every bit of revelation from here, that I can never go wrong with this. No, this word speaks to me directly. This is why you have to, it doesn't matter how much you admire your pastor. It doesn't matter how great a woman of God they are. You have to learn how to separate this word from their humanity. Because what happens is when something happens to their humanity, you fall with this word because you put too much trust in the man and not enough trust in the word. And God is saying, this is why I need you to study to show who approved? Yourself. Yeah. Wow. That's your job. Yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not the pastor's job to continue to find all these great scriptures to excite you. Mm -hmm. For what? For a moment? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen when you go down the stairs and you get a phone call about something that happened in the family? Mm -hmm. Someone that's dear to your heart got hurt. What's going to happen? Can you say, pastor, 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 give me another word? Or do you trust? That what you've heard thus far is enough to hold on, enough to give you strength, enough to know that, that God is amazing and he can get me through this. Because here's the thing, you don't know what's going to happen, but he does. And if nothing else, God, can consult me in how peace can be formed. And this is what I, I'm sharing with most people. And people, I, I, you know, Pastor Alex, at the end of the day, there's so much going on. It, it, so much, absolutely, and it will continue to be so. But the Bible says, and the peace of God, which surpasses all your human understand, will guard your heart, will guard you and keep you in perfect peace. Why? Because your mind will be stayed in a place where it needs to be stayed. Everything starts with a thought. And I remember sharing, when God shared this to me, I, I didn't quite understand because we say this often. I like to multitask. Mm. Something is fully getting your attention and something is not. Mm. Think about that. How much can you really think about four and five different things and give it, give, give all of it your attention? Right, right. Wow. Can't do it. This is why he says you can only serve one master. Because if you have two, you're going to neglect one at some point and pay attention to the next. And this is what we need to do, that even when we come into the house of God, even when we come into a place where we're getting around, it's your job. I don't expect everybody in here to be fully attentive to what's going on. Somebody must have left something on the stove. Some things could have happened on yesterday that's consuming your thoughts on today. There could be some things that you're trying to figure out. Maybe even work is on your mind. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not crazy to believe that we all come in with a full, even while I'm sharing this word, my mind could be somewhere else. And God is saying, as he shared with Jeremiah, I'm with you. But here's the thing. Just because someone's with you doesn't mean you don't ignore them. Somebody can literally be in my presence and talking to me, and I can literally be ignoring them. Which means, how much am I really paying attention to the one who said, will never leave me nor forsake me? Right. Because usually when things start to happen, the first thing we believe is that God left. But his word says, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I will be there until the very end. But here's the thing, if you ignored me, even when the good times were going on, because we were good, once it happened, it was good, but once things started to slow down and die out, I, I wasn't the attention anymore. I wasn't what you gave all your praise to anymore. Once the testimony died out, something else happened and something and someone took my place. He says, you have to forsake all others. If you were not, I'm a jealous guy. I don't like to share you with anyone. But here's the thing, that everyone that's a part of your life, I put them there. And please know that whatever you want to see in that relationship, if you trust me, if you trust me in this relationship, believe that the love that comes from me, that will surpass all of your thinking, will keep this thing going so well 
Because God knows us. He wants to protect us. He wants to guard us. Even while the world is trying to figure out what to do, the Bible says that they wait for us. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that the world waits with eager expectation. You know when someone's eager for something, they can't stand still? It's just, oh, I can't wait, I can't wait. The Bible says that they wait for us, the people of God, to reveal ourselves to them. So it's not always about laying hands. And you want to show people God? Show them love. There are many attributes to God, but God says, I am love. And I have met some of them hmm, in the name of God. Some of the most angry, I mean, angry people. I don't understand. If he's a loving God, how can you be so angry? And what did I do to cause you to be that angry? And how connected are you with a God who says, I'm always around? So he's waking up Jeremiah. He wants to wake up you and I. Because the disappointment comes because man is constantly in one place today, the next place tomorrow. I remember a pastor coming to me and saying, Pastor Alex, what you're doing? It's not good. I said, what do you mean? Don't ever invite people to your home. Not the saints. Mm -mm, don't do the saints. Mm -mm. Mm -mm, don't, don't, most of my people don't even know where I live. And I remember having a conversation with him. He says, because you have to protect yourself. And I said, what does that mean? He said, people will hurt you. He said, but then, I said, but then how do you build relationships? If you're afraid to be hurt all the time, how do you build a relationship? Then it hit me. Most people don't like building relationships because of that very reason. Mm -hmm. So they'll stick with that same people for the rest of their life, but forget meeting someone else. Forget it. And, and, and I'm so wide open to meeting people. I love to meet people. Do you not know with all the traveling Kai and I do, it is very seldom that we stay at a hotel. Why? Because we build such relationships with people that they say stay at our own. And you know what we do? We go and stay at our own. First of all, I just say a bundle of money. And to wake up to a home cooked meal? Are you kidding me? What hotel is going to give me that? <laughs> and what happens is we build these great relationships, but here's the downfall. The downfall is in relationships, they're going to be tried. I tell people all the time don't tell me how much you love me until we bump heads. <clears throat> don't tell me you'll be with me forever and we've yet to have a disagreement. It's during the disagreement that we're going to see where this relationship is. Guess what? God understands that there are times where you are angry with him. God, I don't like the way you did this. And he says, come. I want to talk to you about it too. <laughs> but what we'll do is we'll go to everybody else and tell them. Uh, you ever heard bad news about you through 15 other people, but the person that you upset you never heard it from? <laughs> and how often, how often do we stand before God? And let him understand that we're being honest about where we are and God, we need to hear from you. And here's the thing. Matthew 28, chapter, uh, chapter 28, verse 20, you don't have to go there. It says, Jesus teaches to observe all that he commands. Remember here in Jeremiah chapter 7, he says, whatsoever I command you, that's what you speak. The problem has been that we're coming to God with our own agendas. And he says, see, here's the thing. You've set up too many plans. And if any, not anybody knows my wife, Pastor Kai, she absolutely lets you know that there is only one plan. There's only one. And the plan is to know him. Because he's already set everything in motion. And this is why we're destined for certain places. Because here's the thing. Anything that changes is difficult to find. Can I say that again? Anything that changes, you're going to have a hard time trying to track. But the God who is constant, he is I am the God that don't change. Matthew 28, he ends it with, I am with you always. Which means the reason why God can't change. He says, I'm not like man. I can't lie. Right. Because anything that doesn't change means it stands still long enough until we arrive. But if I was to tell you, I live here today, but I might move next week. 
If your destination is to get to where I am now and I've already shipped it, it's going to be very difficult to find me and it's going to be very difficult to trust me because you don't know if I'll move again. God is constant and he doesn't move. So he says, no, no, you can find me. Seek and ye shall find. And so this is why we have to be ever so mindful that the God that we serve can't change because he has to be constant so that we become constant. Why? Because when he gives a command, you can't deter from it. And this Bible is to let us know that in order for us to say we are who we say we are and to reap the benefits, because he also tells us if a father and mother was to give to their children and they can't be constant all the time, how much more would a consistent God do for you? How much more? So even when those that are so dear to us forsake us, God is still right there and he's never left. But if we only stand still enough to pay attention. And this is what God was sharing with me. Here's the problem. The problem is that God doesn't need us, but he wants us. We need God, but only want him. Can we, can we talk about that for a minute? A God who doesn't need us wants us because love has a way of just putting us in an environment so we can see the fullness. Why? He's God. He can do what he wants, when he wants, however he wants, and he can use anybody to do it. But he says, you need me because without me, you can't breathe. Without me, you can't wake up in the morning. Without me, and let me tell you something, one of the greatest things I've ever been witness to is to come out of a small country and go into a country where their total dependence is on God. Because if it doesn't rain, they don't eat. Sometimes I, I tell people, go, go somewhere else and see what poverty really looks like. See what it really, really does. And you can watch some of these individuals that keep a smile on. We have gone into huts. And we have gotten hospitality that will blow your mind. I told my wife, I said, look down on the floor. They, hmm, dirt floor was cleaner than most people's homes. They took pride in a dirt floor. You wouldn't find a crumb on it. You wouldn't find a piece. It was so amazing because I didn't see ants. I didn't Why? There was nothing for the ants to grab. But dirt. And I said, this, look at the pride. Look at the love. And what they did was they invited us into their most intimate space. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Sound like hey, how to me? They took us into their most intimate spaces and they created a space for us. And we sat there and we ate with them and they shared their hearts. And then they let us know we love what God has done with us. Yeah, we go through drought season. Yeah, sometimes our children are get sick. Yes, yeah, sometimes people pass away, but God is faithful. Then I remember flying back in and got angry. I came to America and got angry. I said, look at this. Look at this. Oh, we are so spoiled. We are so I got angry as if I was holier than thou. I got angry. America. And someone came up to me and said, so you got a healthy frustration, huh? And I sat there and I said, what do you mean? He said, see, most people didn't experience what you experienced, so be very careful to be arrogant when you come back thinking you can cause the change. All you can do is share your experience and let people understand. Because people who don't know what it's like, this is the problem. When a child is spoiled, you can't get mad at the child when the child does not want discipline from their parents. You can't get mad at the child. But all the child knows is, give me what I want. Yeah. Don't tell me to throw out no garbage, because I'm not doing it. Don't tell me to do this, I'm not doing it. Give me what I want. And how many of us Go to God with the same attitude. God, I only want what I want. I don't, I'm not needing on you. I want you to give me what I want. But because I want to do what I want to do. But he says, in order to receive, you have to obey my commandments. And that's one of the most difficult things to do. Because the commandment shifts you. It changes who you are so that you can become greater in him. Remember, he's the same one who knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. The need changes your approach. When you get around people who are in need, they never have a never mind attitude. You can't. If I'm in need of water and you come with water, I'm not going to say, never mind. Don't bother. 
I'm okay. No. So there has to be a thirst for God. This is what he says. If you hunger and thirst for me, then you and I can do some things. We're going to end it. Let's go to Matthew 5, verse number 6. I just want to end it here. Enough to remember. Now, this is Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Call it the Beatitudes. This is when we find out how blessed we are. If anybody has it in the, um, the Message Bible, can you please read Matthew 5, verse 1 through 12? And we will be out of your way. You're blessed when you're, you're, blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourself proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get inside when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. Mm -hmm. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Did everyone get that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a blessed individual. But look at all the things that get connected yeah. to being blessed. Think about that. And this is why when God is dealing with us, he says, if these are the things you want of me, understand that there are certain things that's going to happen in your life, but I need you at that point to trust. I need you to take courage. People will not understand. I remember, I remember my early years in Christianity. My family were excited of the fact, more than anything else, that their brother, Uncle Grant, everything about me being sober they got excited about. It. Because the first thing that God, he cleaned me up and they were excited about that. But then a couple years happened. Now, in a couple years, they don't see me as much. You spend all your time where? You mean you go to work and after work, you go where? I was literally going down to the church that the pastor trusted me so much that he gave me a key. I've never been trusted that way. And I was so excited that someone trusted me that I would go to the, down to the, 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 the local assembly, because we believe that we are the church, but for those who don't, I would go down to the local assembly, and I would, he would give me a key, I would open it up, and I would spend three hours cleaning the place. But what they didn't know, that every time I was cleaning, Every time I was in there, it kept my mind in a place that was safe. Because guess what? The streets were still the streets. The drugs were still the drugs. The disappointment was still the disappointment. I needed to get into a space that could literally keep my mind stayed on God. And my same family who was excited about me being sober now got convicted because they weren't getting sober because they chose not to. And because of that, I had to sit back and love them and say, you know what? That's your life. That's your But don't get angry at me. You spent too much time over there. You're doing too much over there. We don't even see you anymore. You didn't come to your, your, your niece's uh, 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 birthday party. But I know what those birthday parties are. They're not for my niece. They're for you guys to get drunk. Uh, pretty much. So I chose not to go. I came. I came, I showed my niece some love, I gave her a gift, but because I didn't stay in the environment, it had nothing to do with you. I didn't trust me enough to stay there long. So I had to protect me, you loved me being sober. Why put me in an environment now that can literally change the very thing you love? And so I had to make a conscious decision. But now here it is. 
It's 20 years later. Do you not know my niece and my And I'm second to the youngest. They won't even make a decision without calling me. Sometimes I don't even, I don't even know why they call me. But I promise you, for everything that happens, I literally became the pastor of my family. And if nothing else excites me, because I know you guys, I know you guys love me, I know you guys have prayed, but it's something about people who really know you and stay with you. Because when I became a senior pastor and the whole church went up and was clapping and cheering, my response to them was, thank you so much, but if she wasn't clapping, if she wasn't excited, why? Because she's the one who has to see me every day of my life. She knows when Christ is there and when he's not. She knows when I'm angry. She knows when I'm disappointed. And if you don't see her excited, don't get excited about me. Because she, if you ever gone to a place, and I do this often, when I walk into a place and that man that God is preaching, most times the first thing I do is look at his wife. Because she's going to tell me everything about it. Our body language is going to share it, and everything is good. I want why? Because there's nothing more connected than that covenant. It doesn't matter how great the sermon is, how bad. If you're not maintaining your house, the Bible says you're unfit to serve others. So this is why if we let you in our most intimate spaces, because we want you to see who we are. But here's the thing. If I let you in my space, you got to let me in yours too. And that's where the difficulty comes in. Because why? People get disappointed. And you sometimes become the disappointment. And so I have to continue. Because if I adjust myself according to your emotions, then the people who do want to know me don't get to know me because I'm constantly changing. <laughs> so one minute I'm up, next minute I'm down, next minute I'm over here, and God is saying, I'm the God who changes not. Why? Because you need to find me. You need to be constant as a believer. You need to know that you are who you are and you serve who you serve because I am the God that doesn't change. And here's the thing. In Malachi 3, we're going to end it there. He says, you know, I know people love to use that scripture just for tithes and offerings. Please, Malachi 3, there's so much revelation in that. He says, I am the Lord that changes not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Because if God changes and shifts, he knows we cannot survive. We can't survive. He says, I change not, therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Because if I start to shift and go up and down like you guys do, oh no, you'll be done. So God is trying to get us into a place to understand that every time we tell God, never mind, don't bother, what we're really telling him is that my connection to you is really not a full connection. I disconnect myself according to my emotional state, according to where I am, because God, when you start to come in there, and here's the problem, the problem becomes that when the, the spoiled child has to get disciplined, it can only really get disciplined in the place that it knows the love exists. So what happens is the kid gets spoiled, the parents can't deal with them, the kid commits a crime, and now they're forced into a place of listening. This is why you can't pack them in the prison system enough. And as much as we want to call them criminals, and we want to want to call, if you excuse me, if you get to the root of the issue, you will realize that there was love that was absent because the love did not discipline. The love did not chastise. And the Bible tells us that He is the God of discipline. He's the God of order. He does all things orderly. And the discipline is a part of our lives. You can't have a military without discipline. You can't have a corporation without discipline. You can't have love without discipline. And it's amazing that when we get into a place where we have to be checked because we're doing some things we shouldn't be doing. We created some environments that we shouldn't create it. And now we want God to fix it. Or we want people to understand. And instead of getting to the root of the issue, say, no, let's stop. Let's talk about this. I don't want to talk about that. But this is the cause of this. And if you only want to put your focus here, this has the ability of making itself, revive itself in another place. So let's go to the root of the issue so that we can chop. See, you can't just chop a tree off in the middle. You got to get to the root of the issue. If you, if you don't want to see that tree ever again, you have to get to the source of that tree in order to eliminate it. It's the same thing with people's issues and problems. 
And this is why people don't understand, you know, uh, you know, psychiatrists get paid great money. People get paid great money to listen to the surface of your issues and help you in the surface. Guess what? You're coming back to them. You will have one dealing with you for the rest of your life. But when you deal with the things of God, someone who deals with the word of God has to get to the root of the issue, which means that individual has to get their hands dirty. They have to dig in areas because here's the thing about digging where you can't see. You don't know what you're going to touch. And God is saying, and I've learned this from, from, from a great man of God. He says, Alex, do you understand the word pastor? Because I ran for it for so long because of what I, I bear witness to. I told God, whatever it is, do not call me pastor. I don't want to be a pastor. And he had to deal with me. He says, Alex, is it in my word? Yes, it's in your word, God. So it doesn't matter what you see. What did I say? How did I say a pastor is supposed to be? How do I say a pastor is supposed to respond? And there was this great man of God who said, Alex, the word pastor comes from a root word, pastor. And I was like, really? He said, yes. And guess where the pastor is? Well, the pastor is where the animals graze and the, the animals feed off the land. He, he said, yeah, but it's also a place where they get sick. It's also a place where they have to use the bathroom. It's also a place where things happen where people don't want to deal with. If you're going to be a pastor, you've got to receive it all. You can't just receive the good of the people. You got to receive the bad. You got to receive them. There's times that they're going to become ill. There's times where they're going to have to uh, 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 relieve themselves. And guess what you have to do? You got to go out there and clean it up. Because you consider yourself a pasture, a place where people can come and say it's safe. So there are times where it becomes uncomfortable. Why? Because I would just love for it to be me. And my wife just, you know, hanging out and putting our feet up and let's vacation over here. And, and not to say that we don't enjoy the things of God, but at the end of the day, we say yes to this call. Which means we have to come and allow people to share their hearts and not judge them. And not call them this and say this and just give them the instructions and all. No, no, no. We have to walk with them in love. And this is why I don't be so quick. To put your stamp on something without knowing what you're stamping. Someone doesn't just wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I want to be a drug addict and I grow up. I want to be promiscuous. I want to be this. I want to be that. No, those things are established somewhere. And so we as a people who say we have this truth and say we have this love have to go out there when people say, never mind, listen closely to their never mind. You know how, how many never minds I've got from someone only for them to really say, please come and help me? There's a difference. You have to discern. Some people are really, really direct with it, and you have to leave it alone and let God deal with it. Then there are some who say, never mind. So I said, Alex, what you doing? Oh, where are you? I'm going to meet you right now. No, 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 don't come. No, no. That phone call lets me know you want me to come. Oh. <laughs> and this is how we build relationships. This is how we build. So anytime that never mind comes into your spirit, please ask yourself the question why. Because guess what? He already knows. You just need to know. This is the word of the Lord. Any questions, comments, concerns? Wow. You know, silence is always great for me. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing? 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 It's a lot. Please know it's a lot. It's a lot going on around us. The world looks like it's crumbling. People are getting more and more angry. More and more things are happening. But the Bible says to have good courage. He's already won that battle. It doesn't matter what we're seeing, what we're listening to. Keep an ear to hear God. Stay excited about life. Embrace the things that are before you. Instead of concentrating on all the pain, why don't you concentrate on all that love he showed you today? And when people want to have a pity pat party, excuse yourself. I want to be here. I'm going over here. I want to smile today. I want to laugh today. And it's not to say you can't concern yourself with people, but make sure you know when people want to stay where they are in that pity pat party. And then you know when people are really, really seeking help. And if they're seeking help, let them see the excitement about what you bring because you should know that if you show up, you have the ability to change that atmosphere. Amen? Yes, Michael? Um, amazing word, Pastor. Thank you. 
I think the thing that struck me with today's word is specifically the word discipline. And sometimes I, when I read the word, I look at specific people in the Bible, and I always look at Paul, and I'm always like, Paul, what an amazing man who went from being a persecutor of Christians to be one of the most devoted and disciplined Christians that have ever lived. And I always know well, what's the difference, and I think the difference usually is when we talk about that emotional roller coaster is do we choose to stay um, um, grounded, always abounding in the Word of God? Because I know for me personally, the moment that I step away, or I don't say step away, but the moment that I, let's just say I went you know, several days without the Word of God, mm-hmm. and we talked about this on Wednesday Bible study that give us to stay our daily bread. Yeah. So for me to be uh, malnourished for three days, something's gonna affect my body or affect my spirit. And I realize that we can't even, we, we when you don't at least say, God, I'm gonna pray and get in your word daily. Like that simple gesture has monumental consequences. Yeah. Because I know that when I'm focused on him and seeking him, my mind and everything I'm about is focused. I don't have emotional roller coasters. It's the moment that I decide to not seek him. It's the moment that I decide I don't really need him. Like what I'm, my work or the things that are on my mind, my bills, the world, the moment I allow the world to be more consuming than to be consumed by the all consuming God, that my life is in shambles. And I think part of that is because we don't choose to be disciplined. You don't choose that. You make a choice every day whether you want your spirit man to wake up or you want your flesh to wake up. And the moment that you allow your flesh to wake up as you always talk about, you, anything can happen. Anything can happen. I'm talking about from the moment you get out. And it's crazy because I, I've been trying in practice, every morning when I wake up, I'm like, even before I get out of bed, I want to be like, spirit man, take control, flesh die. Because I feel like the moment you get out of bed, anything can shift you. I mean, you could not even leave your room and a, a crazy thought will come over you, or uh, you get a phone call and you're like, wow. And so um, I just thank you for the reminder that we really don't have to have these emotional roller coaster days, weeks, months. That if we just stay disciplined and, 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 and in prayer and in communication and in His Word, our life can be consistent. You know, I, I, I even look at the example of um, when when they were in the boat, and because they didn't focus on Jesus, they were all like scared and oh yeah, we're gonna. And it was all about staying focused on Him. Mm-hmm. And so uh, thank you for that reminder that our life doesn't have. Oh, this is what life is like. But it doesn't have to be. Even with the, if he says trial and tribulation will come, that's a given. So if that's a given, how can I continue to stay focused on him and still be at peace? That's good. That's good. One of the things I, I'm going to share briefly, one of the things that really stood out to me, even with what you said, when we consider Paul, we forget that Paul literally helped kill the first deacon of the Bible. He helped to kill Stephen. He, he stoned him. And sometimes, let me tell you what gets me through. It's been, it's been 20 plus years being in ministry now. I never forget those moments of sleeping on a park bench. I never forget those hard times in my life because when hard times hit, it, it ain't gonna be that hard. It doesn't matter, I promise you. It doesn't matter what's in front of me or how bad it gets. Those moments back then, I thank God so much for those moments because it allows me to have such an appreciation about life. Because every time I think about those moments, I should not have survived it. I shouldn't. And now that I'm here, all I want to do is to the best of my ability, because I know I can't get it perfect, but to the best of my ability, love like God loves. To the best of my ability, I'm going to love. 
I, I, that's all I want because the love he's shown me, it just, it, it, it just blows my mind. So Paul, who is to say? You never hear about it. You never even, even hear Paul talk about it, um, you know, killing Stephen. It. But it's clear in the Bible that he was responsible for his death. And maybe that alone is what made Paul say, I don't care if you take me out. Because what I've done, and God forgave me for what I've done, it doesn't matter what you do. Because I know that the ultimate goal sure ain't here. <laughs> So thank you for that, because that's the stuff that stands out. We talk about this great man, Paul, but we forget that Paul was Saul. Yeah. Yes, sir. I was talking to that interesting dude I shared with you. A few months ago, we had moved the house back in England with, with the hospital. I was walking past, and this lady, she came to the bus address from the day to work. I told her she's not that good, she's got a heart attack. And that she was loving her. And she wear a traditional kind of clothes. But she's a humble person. One day I used to walk past and she saw a piece of bread on the floor. She picked it up and put it in her hands. Wow, look. What happened in those countries? When somebody sees a piece of bread is thrown on the floor, mm -hmm. they pick it up, they kiss it, they put it in the put it in the place with the respect. attention to the world, you'll see God everywhere. Pay close attention. Pay close. Don't, don't, don't think they don't hear. Don't think they because of where they're at and where, what they might be doing. Don't get it twisted. So those type of moments are great moments for us to have because God speaks to us in those moments. 
with a great appreciation. Anyone else? Yes, Jeanette. Um, this is really good. Thank you. Um, two things that stood out for me is when you um, talk about God being constant, and I've heard that so many times, but you just gave clarity to why he's constant so that we can find him yeah. and that we know where to go. And when you gave that visualization, the 